4. The cultivation and promotion of impotence. Calcedon Position Paper No. 84, March 1987. In her study, The Night in History, 1984, Francis Guise tells us of the growth of irrelevance in knighthood. Originally, the knight was an important and key figure in feudal society. However, after 1050, knights began to stress their status rather than function, and what had been a rank became a hereditary caste. Page 26. In time, their lives and their tournaments became an adjunct of theatrical productions and partook of their character. Page 200. The same thing in time became true of royalty. It became a matter of blood and theatre. Earlier, a ruler like William the Conqueror was a bastard whose mother was emphatically not royalty. Later, such a king was ruled out. It was not ability that counted, but blood. Royal, quote, courts, end quote, ceased to be a place of justice and became social centres where dress prevailed in importance over character and ability. What had happened was that men preferred the facade to reality. The centres of power became centres of fashion and theatre, not of justice and government, and before long, they lost their power. When fashion and theatricals become more important to those in power than justice and social advancement, then the end is not far away. To prefer fashion and theatre to justice means that the ruling powers have lost their hold on reality. They seek admiration and envy, not results and progress. But this is not all. Art is divorced from Christianity to become a substitute for religion, and the power elite becomes linked to an art elite which is similarly out of touch with reality. Each serves to exalt the other as they go blindly into destruction. Such a direction is not limited to heads of states. It is also true of the world of commerce. Otto Scott has often commented on a revealing aspect of the life of corporations. Their founders are true entrepreneurs, men of ability, vision and foresight. As innovators, they build a great industrial empire out of little or nothing other than their dedication and ingenuity. Such men vary in character, and their biographies reveal sometimes very real flaws but they were builders. But there was another fact about them. Often they were short and unprepossessing in their appearance. Many had character traits which today would lead to their immediate rejection by any personnel departments. If they appeared today looking for jobs with firms they established, they would be rejected. It was rare for any of these innovators to have a college degree. Today, the firms they founded take college men only, and only those over six feet in many cases. The result is cloning an image of an advertising agency's fashion plate. Is it any wonder that the corporations are having problems? The same problem exists in the church. Administration is often given priority over pastoral and preaching concerns. Ministerial relations committees handle placements in many church bodies, and these committees are more often concerned about loyalty to the church than loyalty to Christ and Scripture. Such a superficial churchmanship leads to a theatrical view of reality. Ecumenical meetings by failing churches pronounce all kinds of judgment on things they know little about. There is more concern with public relations and a good press than there is with reality. 
In the world of the theatre, life and death are both make-believe, not reality. Reality is no longer real to some people. Theodore Schenck, in his study of the American Alternative Theatre, 1982, which he found pleasing on the whole, cited one leading figure in the theatre who declared, Life, revolution and theatre are the words for the same thing. An unconditional no to the present society. But to equate revolution and theatre with life is to have lost a hold on reality, Shanks said of the living theatre group. Life is theatre, and theatre is their life. Such a view means that a hold on reality is lost. It should not surprise us, then, that one performer has insisted. Acting is not make-believe, but living exquisitely in the moment. This is the avant-garde theatre today, and this, too, is much of our world. It feels that only when one is on stage, only when one is a part of a living theatre, is life real. One man seriously told me that to be truly alive, one had to live in New York City. Is it any wonder today that more and more of our news and politics is dominated by press conferences, public hearings and television coverage than by actions and accomplishments? On stage, life and death are make-believe, not real. So too are births, accomplishments and victories. When men move from reality to theatre, they sentence themselves to impotence. For the living dead, there are virtues in impotence. It means none of the pains, expenses and heartbreaks of family life, of birth and death, and the partings of ways. Impotence eliminates many of the cares and problems which are basic to life. Our age obviously loves impotence and death. It favours homosexuality, abortion, euthanasia and more. It will not face up to the growing epidemics of AIDS and it continues to live in its fantasy world. The Presbyter Salvian, describing the fall of Trier in the last days of the Roman Empire, tells us that men did not defend the city because they were too interested in the games at the arena. After the rape, looting and burning of Trier, the survivors petitioned the emperor to rebuild their arena so that the games could go on and their morale improved. Salvian said of Rome, It is dying, but continues to laugh. So too this modern age, it is dying, but continues to laugh. Impotence today is cultivated on all sides. A few years ago at its inception, I joined a national group ostensibly dedicated to studying and implementing matters of national policy. Its members were to be Christians and Conservatives. Very quickly, in only a few years, it has become theatre. It is more interested in providing a forum for big names than in serious study. Its meetings are now expensive social events. One might say that Instead of being a training ground for war horses, it has become the gathering place to produce geldings and mules. Impotence is cultivated, and ineffectuality is the order of the day. Men must love impotence because they spend so much money to produce it. In 1947, in The Abolition of Man, C.S. Lewis began with a telling chapter on men without chests, that is, on education as planned sterility. At the end of the chapter, he said, In a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. 
we make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honour and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. Page 16. This is true not only of education, but of every area of life and thought. The culture and promotion of impotence is central to our contemporary culture. Biblical faith is vital and demanding. It requires that we die in Christ and become a new creation in Him. It requires our total surrender. We must become Christ's creation and creatures. The world prefers surface religion. It was surface religion which destroyed the medieval church long before the Reformation. Margaret Wade Labarge, in her study of Henry V, 1975, wrote of the fact that Henry took his religious duties seriously. However, with most people, religion had become conventional. Conventional religious practice required no individual initiative and did not necessarily imply any personal commitment. A look at the hierarchy of the day provides still another impression of decent formalism. Page 95 Before the immoralism of recent years, we too had our era of decent formalism. It has given way to indecent immoralism and rebellion. I have had calls from time to time from troubled pastors, all with a common problem. People visit their church to see what's happening. They want a church where they can be spectators to much action, but they do not want to be part of the work. One pastor reported that one visiting couple said that they wanted a church where things happen and miracles take place. They did not ask for an opportunity to serve. They wanted to be spectators. This is an easy route to damnation. Given the modern perspective, when Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, instead of asking, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Acts chapter 9 verse 6. Paul instead should have asked, Lord, what's in it for me? Returning again to Henry V, Labarge's comment is of interest when she says of medieval kingship that it was associated with justice. Justice was the prime virtue of a medieval king, page 187. Not all medieval kings were just, but enough of them were, and the concern for the realities of rule, not theatricals, governed them. Even ungodly kings were able to retain power because they did not lose touch with reality. Monarchy disappeared when it became theatre, when it lost touch with reality. Ludwig of Bavaria, Richard Wagner's friend and patron, was such a ruler. He was far more beneficent than many a predecessor, but his idea of kingship was so unrealistic and so theatrical that it proved suicidal for the future of the crown. Wagner himself took Germany and much of the Western world into a land of fantasy and irrelevance. Wagner adopted the current anthropological doctrine of myth as a higher reality and thus a higher realm of truth. The same evil doctrine is widely prevalent today, especially in seminaries, both Catholic and Protestant. A myth is said to be a higher form of religious truth and is not to be confused with falsehood. By, quote, seeing, end quote, the mythological character of the Bible, we supposedly have a firmer grip on truth and reality. 
How much trust can we place in a mythological bridge across a canyon? Such men insist that these myths embody a higher reality. But, in so speaking, they declare themselves to be, at the very least, fools, if not knaves. Such professors turn Christianity from the truth of God into a lie called myth. They insist that theatre in the form of myth is reality, and that, by implication, reality is unreal. We live in an age when men believe that life is theatre, and theatre is their life. They insist that acting is not make-believe, but living exquisitely in the moment. This is insanity and a flight from reality. But that flight from reality is all around us. Press conferences replace action, and public relations govern the world of living theatre. The curtain always comes down on the stage. The play acting comes to an end. But life goes on. It does not end with us, nor with our children. And we cannot ring down the curtain on neat and invented endings made for an imaginary theatrical world without birth or death. The world of the, quote, living theatre, end quote, is not for us. We are told, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Revelation chapter 18, verses 4 and 5. The impotent have no future. The cultivation and promotion of impotence is the calling of the humanists. Our Lord is the Lord of life 